Well, hello and welcome to lesson 17-3. We're actually on our last lesson of activity 17. We've been looking at similarity transformations and how that's a little bit different than our congruence transformations. In this lesson, we're going to study the properties of similar figures. You know, in lesson unit two, or excuse me, in unit two, we spent a lot of time looking at properties of congruent figures. And now we're going to look at the properties of similar figures. And so just think about that word, what similar means in just regular context, and we'll see how it applies in geometry. So let's look at our learning targets. As always, we are going to identify properties of similar figures. Just like we identify properties of congruent figures, we're going to see what properties similar figures have. And then we're going to start applying those properties, especially to solve different parts of our similar figures. So if you would take a second and draw a line at the bottom of your page, number three. So we're going to chunk numbers one through three together. So attempt to do one through three on your own. Number one is definitely a continuation of lesson 17-2. So if it gives you a little trouble, go back to 17-2. But work through one through three before playing through the video. Okay, hopefully you took some time to figure this out. A couple things that we should probably point out before we go over the answers is we're seeing a similarity statement now, which we discovered what a congruency statement was. It's actually very similar to a congruency statement, except they use a different symbol here. So remember congruent is that little wavy symbol above the equal sign and similar is just the wavy symbol. And that kind of makes sense. We kind of get rid of the equal sign between these two symbols because we're not saying that these two shapes or figures are equal. They're similar. And I did point out that the order still matters because we're talking about corresponding parts such that point A corresponds to A prime, B corresponds to B prime, and so forth. So A, the task was to describe a sequence of similarity transformations that maps A, B, C, D, to A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. So the first thing hopefully you notice is that there had to be a dilation involved because A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime is larger in scale to rectangle A, B, C, D. So the way again to find um, the scale factor is you take the length of one side of the image and divide it by the length of its corresponding side in the pre-image. So the length from A prime to B prime was seven and a half, and the length from A to B was three, and that fraction reduces to 2.5. So that's our scale factor. So the first thing I did over here was I figured out where A was and then where A prime was, and I started to fill in this middle gap after I figured out that the scale factor was 2.5. So I dilate about the origin with scale factor 2.5. So that's what I did here. I went negative one zero, multiplied both of those coordinates by 2.5, and I got negative 2.50. Did the same thing with B, C, and D. And so this is where I ended up after the dilation, these four coordinates. And then I noticed that what happened was negative 2.5, the original X value, swapped places with the zero. Well, then, you know, to write a function, we have to be sure that every coordinate obeys that same rule. So then I went to the second coordinate, B, and I noticed something even more stunning. They did swap, but look what happened to the 7.5. It became negative. Now, we couldn't see that on the first coordinate because zero becoming negative is still zero, but that's consistent with these other three. So the function that we use for our final position was negative y x, which is a 90 degrees counterclockwise rotation. And maybe you didn't see that with the coordinates, but hopefully you see where B was and where B prime is. And recall, and I'll just give you a little tip here, to find the um, degree of rotation, you connect the point to the center to its image. And there's a 90 degree angle between B the origin, and its image. So that's how I figured that one out. You can use whatever tactics you have. 
whatever resources you have. But that's what I did to figure that one out. And it asks on B, do you get the same image if you perform the similarity transformations in a different order? Absolutely. We could actually switch these um, two transformations around and we still get the same result. Pretty cool with similar similarity transformations. Number two then says each similarity transformation described in item one preserves angle measures. We saw that in lesson 17 too, as well when we were playing with GeoGebra that the angles don't change. The corresponding angles do not change measures. You know, we still have all 90 degree angles between these two rectangles. So we can make the bold statement that similar figures have corresponding angles that are congruent. The side lengths obviously change, right? The length of AB was three units. The length of A prime B prime is seven and a half, but the angle A is congruent to A prime. So there's one property of similar figures is that the corresponding angles are congruent. Now three leads us into the second property of similar figures. It says, write the ratios. Now, if you forgot what a ratio is, it's just a comparison of two numbers. In fact, slope is a ratio. It's just a comparison of the rise over the run, right? So write the ratios, and there's two ways to write ratios. You could write it as a fraction, such that A over B, or A to B. Now, more than likely, we'll be hanging out with the fraction form of ratios for now, but write the ratios of the corresponding side lengths of the pre-image and image. What do you notice about it? So I compared A prime B prime to its corresponding side AB, and I got 7.5 over 3. That's actually how we found the scale factor. Ring any bells? Then I uh, wrote the ratio comparing A prime D prime to AD and got 15 over 6 and thought, okay, well, that's a little interesting there. And then I got the same ratio when I compared B prime to C prime, or B prime C prime to BC, which makes sense. These are two opposite sides of a rectangle, they should be the same. And then B prime D prime compared to BD was the same as my original ratio. But what we really should notice about all four of these ratios is that they're actually equivalent to each other. If you take 7.5 and divide by three, you get two and a half. If you take 15 divided by six, you get two and a half. In fact, all four of these ratios are equivalent. Not sure if this was covered earlier in your geometric or mathematics classes, but if ratios are equal, we use the term proportional. So the ratios of corresponding sides were equivalent, therefore corresponding sides are proportional. So let's take a moment and make some conclusions about similar figures. We'll actually do that on the next page since we're running out of a little room here. So over in the notes section, We'll compare congruent figures and corresponding figure, or excuse me, similar figures. So we know with congruent figures, corresponding angles were congruent and corresponding sides were congruent. That's why we called them congruent figures. Every corresponding part was in fact congruent. However, with similar figures, corresponding angles are still congruent, but corresponding sides are proportional, which means their ratios are equivalent. So that's the big change here with similar figures is that the corresponding sides are now proportional. They're not congruent. And we're going to see how we can use that fact to help us solve problems. So now we're on item four. So if you would go ahead and draw a line at the very bottom of your page, we're going to work through all the way through part E. So pause the video, complete item four before playing through. So Kate met with her final client, you know, Kate, the graphic designer, and she's creating a wall mural. And so they tell us that she has a prototype picture, something small that she can actually hold. And she wants to compare that to the mural that she's going to create on the wall. 
And so we have here the picture, what it's going to look like on the wall, and the picture of the prototype. And A says, which sides of the two rectangles are corresponding? So the first thing, and the reason they ask that is because they've told us that these two rectangles are in fact similar, which means that the angles are congruent and sides proportional. And if sides are proportional, we can then write ratios that are equal. And that's gonna help us find this missing height of the wall. I'll say that again. When we know that sides are proportional, we can write ratios that are equal. So I said that the 14 foot side of the wall corresponds to the 31.5 inch side of the prototype. And I emphasize that for a reason. And the X feet, the what we're trying to find, the height of the wall corresponds to the 18 inch side of the prototype. And so it's important when we compare proportions that we use similar units of measure. Since the prototype, both of these values are in inches, I went ahead and converted the 14 feet to inches. In doing so, we take 14 times 12 because there's 12 inches in a foot and we get 168 inches. So we're now we're gonna use that measurement 168 inches in place of 14 feet, just so that we're using all the same units of measure. So B says write two different proportions that could be used to find the height of the wall. So it's important, and the reason A, we figured out which sides were corresponding is when you write proportions, corresponding parts have to be in a particular order. So I gave you an example over here. If A corresponds to X and B corresponds to Y, these are two different ways we could write the ratio. So A and B might be on the same figure, two different parts. So we can compare two different parts on the same figure to two corresponding parts on a different figure. Or if A really does correspond to X, we can go and compare in one fraction two corresponding parts on different figures to a similar ratio of two corresponding parts on those two different figures. So we can compare 168 to 31.5, and that's probably the most obvious. These two sides compare. And the ratio that it would be equal to, we would go back to the wall and say X compares to 18. So we could use that ratio or that proportion. Or we could say 168, the width of this wall compares to the height. So on the same figure, and then do likewise on the other ratio that the width of the prototype compares to the height of the prototype. So those two proportions could work. And so that leads us in item C asking, could this proportion work? Could it be used to find the height of the wall? I'll explain why or why not. And I said no, because corresponding sides are not in the correct position in the proportion. Sure, X corresponds to 18, X corresponds to 18, but they have 31.5 and 168 flipped. See, X is the height of the wall and 31.5 is the width of the prototype and those two do not correspond. Now that we figured out how to write a correct proportion, we lead into D to actually find the height of the wall. And one of the easiest ways to use a proportion is cross multiply, where you literally multiply to create a cross. 168 times 18 is 3024. 31.5 times X is 31.5 X. So now we have this equation, 31.5 X equals 3024. And we're gonna divide both sides by 31.5 to solve for X. And we get 96 inches. But since the original unit of measure for the wall was feet, I decided to convert 96 inches back into feet by now dividing by 12. 96 divided by 12 is eight feet. So. We just figured out how to properly write or recalled how to properly write proportions. We use those proportions to solve a missing part of a similar figure. And then item E just takes it a step further to recall how to find the area of the wall. So area of a rectangle is length times width and or base times height or length times height. Just really the two units of measure on the uh, linear dimensions of this rectangle. So I'm gonna use the feet dimensions. So area will be 14 feet times eight feet. Therefore, the area is 112 feet 
squared or square feet. Remember, area is always measured in squared units. Now, if you're wondering why do they do this, if you've ever bought a can of paint before, they actually tell you how many square feet that can of paint will cover. So obviously Kate was trying to figure out how many square feet this mural was going to take up so she would know how much paint she would probably need to create it. So quite a bit of information here. Definitely probably a lot of review of things you haven't done before or done lately of writing proportions, solving proportions, and using the fact that corresponding sides are proportional to solve parts of similar figures. Now, the last thing we're going to do together is to check your understanding right before the lesson practice. So if you would, you can draw a line if you wish. Complete items five through six before playing through the video. Okay, hopefully you took a second to check your understanding, right? If we can work through five and six, we've got the gist of lesson 17-3. So it tells us rectangle DEFG is similar to rectangle WXYZ, which tells us corresponding angles are congruent and corresponding sides are proportional. So they want to know which side lengths must be proportional. And just like our congruency statements, similarity statements, whatever order they put these two, uh, the names of these rectangles in, the vertices listed are in corresponding order. So D, vertice D or vertex D corresponds to vertex W. Vertex E corresponds to vertex X and so forth. So I just drew a quick diagram just so I'd make sure I would do it correctly. And if I did D, E, F, G, my second rectangle, I did W, X, Y, Z. Now I wrote all of these ratios equal because they told us the two rectangles were similar, which means they all the side lengths are proportional. So DE corresponds to WX, therefore they're proportional. EF corresponds to XY, FG corresponds to YZ, and last, DG corresponds to WZ. Now that we can write proportions, we're going to use them to solve a missing value of these two similar rectangles. So again, there's two ways to write proportions. I showed you both, and you might even mix these up a little bit more. Now this one, it took a little figuring here. You know, I did some cross multiplying. 12 times 9 is 108. 18 times x is 18x. Divided and found x was 6. But on this one, you might be wondering, how did I get the answer so quick? Well, I noticed the relationship between these two numbers. I saw that 18 is twice that of 9. So 12 needs to be twice that of x, really just using what we learned about scale factor and how these two are different. So I figured out that x had to be 6 because half of 12 is 6. So we have reached the end of lesson 17-3. Be sure to do the practice. It's excellent practice. And as always, go back to the learning targets and kind of reevaluate how much you understood on a scale from 0 to 5. Thanks for watching.